there will be six, no, sorry, there will be five. Haha, see this morning there used to be six. So these nodes will definitely get fixed. Um, so um, there will be five nodes, five short lectures. I, I was too ambitious. I thought I could have one about higher inductive types, but I think it would be too much material. So we're just going to do five. Um, and uh, we'll just start with the first one. And this first one, if you look at the schedule, I will try to stick to the schedule. Actually, I will quite be quite strict about sticking to the schedule. The first one is supposed to go on until 1450, including the exercises. OK, so here's something about the background reading. You should be looking uh, at the textbook. Hot book chapter one is also uh, a reasonable textbook. And there are other, there are other uh, resources. OK, so part one, Martin Löw type theory. Uh, given the, uh, given the, the polls that we, uh, we, we, we asked the participants to um, fill out an, a poll, it looked like there aren't that many people who are absolutely beginners in all kinds of type theory and lambda calculus. So I'm going to have half an hour introduction to type theory, which I hope will be sufficient. Um, so first of all, Martin Löw type theory, or better homotopy type theory, the, the formalism that we're going to use, is a foundational system. So it's, it's, it provides a foundation. What does that mean? It means two things. It means that it doesn't rely on any other foundation, something that's beneath it. For instance, in particular, it doesn't rely on any kind of logic or set theory or category theory. It just stands on its own. That is to say, just like we normally build logic and set theory when we uh, specify a formal system for logic, here we're going to specify a formal system for type theory from scratch. By scratch, very important, by scratch, I don't mean that I will pretend that I was born yesterday. By scratch, I mean that it's a, a mathematical theory which stands on its own without relying on another mathematical theory. But of course, I am allowed to use my usual mathematical experience as to how these things are done. Um, and uh, if I had to describe with one phrase what type theory is about, I would say it's a theory of constructions. So it tells you in an abstract way and in a very general way how mathematical objects are built or constructed, built. Uh, or constructed and how they are manipulated, how they're taken apart, how they're put together, things like that. It's like Lego blocks, right? You get a bunch of Lego blocks, you play with them. Or, you know, before you start proving things about triangles, you learn how to draw triangles. So it's about that. It's about how to construct mathematical objects. In particular, it's not about what is the case and what is not the case. That is what logic is about. Logic likes logical statements, which make statements of fact that something is the case or that something isn't the case. Now, very importantly, you might have, everybody may have their own ideas of what construction means. And in fact, there are many things that a construction, the word construction can mean a lot of things to different people. To computer scientists, it might mean, for example, for example, it might mean building data values of a data type in a programming language. And that is a entirely reasonable notion of construction. To somebody who is more classically minded, construction could just mean that you're constructing elements of sets and there, or that you're constructing sets and even maybe using excluded middle and axiom of choice. There is nothing wrong with that either. That is as well is a notion of construction. That is to say, I'm not trying to attach any philosophical meaning in the sense of constructive mathematics to the word construction. I want to be very open to what a construction is. It's just the basic rules of how we make objects in mathematics. Now, we are going to take today here a very geometric view. So I will speak of constructing points and paths in spaces. So it's not going to be about data types and it's not going to be just about sets, even though sets will appear, uh, uh, but it's going to be about points, spaces. I will draw pictures where possible. Oh, another way of thinking of constructions is that Proofs are also constructions because, uh, you know, what is a proof? Well, a proof is uh, essentially a formal proof of a statement is a derivation tree which shows you why the statement holds. 
or if you are married to the Hilbert style logic, then it's a sequence of reasoning steps, but I would advertise that it's a, a deduction tree is so a, maybe a slightly better view. Um, so that's also kind of construction. So the word construction can even encompass notions that come up in logic. Okay, so what are the basic concepts of type theory? Well, they're types and we will also just call them spaces where there is a very important caveat here. If you already know topology or are just normally trained mathematician, if you're a normally trained mathematician, you have seen many definitions of space, metric space, Euclidean space, topological space, okay? So this is today, what we're doing today is also a kind of space, but it isn't exactly or precisely any, any, any particular one that uh, you, may, you may have in mind. So you have to take this word space as if you're trying to learn a new idea of what space might be like. Uh, uh, when will it be? Christian is going to speak about uh, models of type theory. And he will, for example, then relate what we're doing today to a very specific notion of space, um, you know, namely cubicle sets and, and simplicial sets. So when we have a type, we can assert that A is a type by just writing A type. Now types have elements and we will also call them points because we think of A as a space. So we write T colon A. Um, you should think of a type as a type of construction. So a type tells you what kind of structure the points have. So for instance, if I say that the type is a Cartesian product of two types, then you will know that the points are uh, ordered pairs. It's not, this is, this is in contrast to set theory where a set doesn't describe what the structure of its elements is because you can make a set that has different elements that have no common structure at all. So a set is really about collecting things and grouping them together. That's not what a type is about. A type is about describing a certain, a certain structure, overall structure of, a, of, of, of points and you know, something like, oh, you know, it's a torus, oh, it's a circle. Um, so the important bit is the structure of the space, not so much the points. It's, it's, so we will come back, we'll keep returning to this. Um, so if I spoke in terms of like, if I speak to a more classically trained mathematician, I'm going to say, don't forget that the space has a topology. It's not just its points. It's just that that's, that's the only remark I'm really making is that a space has structure other than just its points. It could be a metric, it could be a topology. In our case, it's going to be the uh, path spaces. So it's going to be what are the paths in a space? That's going to be the structure that we're interested in. Now, an important point here is also that we are doing dependent type theory. What does dependent mean? Well, dependence is a phenomenon that appears in uh, ordinary mathematics every day. But let me just write it. Uh, let, let, me, let me just write it down here um, formally. So what we want to say is that we don't just say like this, A is a type. We don't just say A is a type. Let me try to get a marker going maybe. So well, how about this and this? So this is, there is more to it than just is a type like this, okay? This is just saying it's a bare, bare statement, A is a type. The important bit is that you can have a type and what type it is depends on some parameters. And these parameters here are collected and they're like free variables or free parameters. And this is saying X1 is a free parameter of type A1, X2 is a free parameter of A uh, type A2. And this is called a context. And it's usually denoted with the capital Greek letter gamma. And I have no idea why. Okay, so what are some examples from real life here? Whenever you say something like R to the N, you say, consider a vector in R to the N. R to the N is like, a, is a space, right? So it's a type. Um, so this, however, it depends on n because what its dimension is, is a function of this parameter n. So formally we would write it like this, right? We would say in the context where n is n, r to the n is a type. Another one is a closed interval. So if you take the closed interval of all elements from a to b, then it depends on a couple of things. 
Now, somewhat surprisingly, it doesn't depend on two things. It depends on three things. So it depends on both A and points, A and B, obviously, because which interval you get depends on A and B. But suppose you want to say that such an interval is a valid type, provided A is less than or equal to B. Well, then it's also going to depend on the fact that A is less than or equal to B. So here you would say something like this. In the context, we have two parameters, A and B, which are the endpoints. But when we have a third parameter, P, which is the witness, the proof, or evidence that A is less than or equal to B, and then we can form the type. Apart from having points and types, we also have a notion of equality, which when we need to make it precise, we shall call it judgmental equality. You will hear people say definitional equality. I don't like the word definitional equality. I think it's confusing. This is called judgmental equality because these are judgments here. And of course, judgments also appear in context. So we should really be saying here that we can have gamma, oops, that we can have gamma here. And this is saying A and B are equal types or S and T are equal points of type A. Um, so far, nothing too surprising is going on. So why would we want equality? Well, because if we can only just build things and never, never say anything interesting about them, then that's going to be a rather boring exercise. Even with Lego blocks, you might be entertained when you notice that you can build a house in the same house in several different orders, but it always comes out at the same, as the same house. That would be an equality about Lego blocks. So you want that sort of thing. Uh, this is not logic. There is no way to say that two things aren't equal. You can only observe that a construction has been made. So the way you read this, TA, is T is a valid construction of type A. This is like, I, I think I wrote somewhere, this is like when a kid makes something out of Lego blocks and they run to their father and they say, look what I did. That's what this is, T colon A. See, nobody ever runs to their father and show them that they didn't do anything. Okay, so that's why you don't have negations of constructions. That doesn't make sense. We'll have negations within type theory later on. So we can construct things, we can observe that they're equal. Okay, so as a formal system, and we're not going to get into that, but that is a subject that maybe some, some of you care about. Um, as a formal system, we would say that there are four judgment forms, which are hypothetical judgment forms. Hypothetical because they, ha they happen in contexts. So these contexts are like available hypotheses. And there are four forms of judgment that you can make. That something is a type, that the point has, that, that, that T is a point in the type of type A, that types are equal and that points are equal. And then of course you would specify type theory by providing rules of inference. And I'm going to write some rules of, inf rules of inference, but not too many. And I'll be kind of sloppy about them. Nevertheless, we have to understand the basic notation, which is that we have these kinds of fractions, if you have never seen them before, what, how the way you read this is, if the judgments on the top have been derived using rules inductively, then the conclusion may also be derived. And the things on the top are called the premises and the thing on the bottom is called the conclusion. So, um, okay. Ah, somebody in chat asked whether these types here, may be, how these types exactly depend each type AI may depend on all the previous ones. So this is a, these are dependent contexts. Okay, what's the geometric picture? I wanna sell you a, a picture. So how do you think of the fact that you have a type B in context A? So you have a B which depends on A. Um, so, so uh, yeah, the chat is saying in the interval example, P depended on A and B, which is true, right? So um, the type of P depended on A and B. So uh, here we go. Suppose you have a type. The way that you can think of it is like this. You will hear, you will hear other lecturers this week. I'm sure they will tell you things like B is a type over A, or they will say A, B is a family over A. Why is it over A? Well, because the mental picture that you should have is that a is like a base space, it's a space downstairs. And then for every point, for every point in the base space X, we get a type B of X. So if I drew here another Y, then up here, I would have a different type 
I'll have a type B of Y and so on. And maybe here at the very end, this type is kind of small and puny, but it's there, okay? And so each one of these has its own points. Um, and as I vary the type, as I vary my base point, then also this type will vary. So it's dependent on the point. Now you will also hear the geometric um, phrase that B of X is the fiber at X, because you can think of this, if you think of this as a map, so you see this gray thing, I can collect all the fibers together and I get a type of all the, the which is called the total space. And we will see in a moment that that's just the dependent sum. And so you can think of there being a, a map, which is the first projection, which goes down. And so if you ask, what is the inverse image of X under that picture, you will get here the thing that's called normally called fiber. Okay. So that's the picture we should have. How do we understand a, um, how do we understand what a point is? Notice that if you, have a, if you have a point which depends on parameter, that's not one point, that's many points. For every X, I get a point. So here Y, there is, there is going to be, there's going to be here a T of Y. In every fiber, I will get a point. So that's really more like, a function from A going up such that if you go back down, you get the, the identity. So it just goes up vertically. And this green thing is then T. That's called a section in geometry. So the points are like sections. If you're, if you're a computer scientist and you haven't done lots of geometry, this is a good opportunity to think about these things, how these things are geometric. And then I think it's quite fruitful to also think about this geometric picture is fruitful also if you're a computer scientist, because sometimes it gives you intuitions that you would otherwise lack. Okay, so what are some basic type constructions? First, we have the dependent sum. So the dependent sum now is formed like this. Here is an informal description of the dependent sum. Um, and uh, you can look up in various places, the formal description, the appendix of the hot book, uh, Egbert is going to nod if there is a more formal description of dependent sum somewhere in his book. Yes, he's nodding. Okay, so you can find it there. Okay, so what are the elements? Well, the elements are the ordered pairs where this P disappeared somehow. They are the um, ordered pairs of the form ST, where S has to be from A and B has to, T has to be from B of S. So, of course, while I write this, I expect you to guess that. What this, that here I have a presupposition, of course. I'm not crazy, right? So I will only write this if I know that I have a type A and I have a type B over A. So if I have type A, B, which depends on A, like that. Okay, so these are the presuppositions before you even start forming this. If we looked at the formal rules, then this, rule, this would be explicit. Um, the elements are ordered pairs, and there are two things you can do with ordered pairs. You can project out the first and the second component. Um, so, you know, if this is, if we take that picture of the egg that we had, so if we take this picture here, what would it look like? It would look like this. We would say, okay, so we have a type, we have A. And now the total space is when you put together all these fibers and then a typical element here is going to be an ordered pair ST. So I feel like this is a bit too thick. And so here we're going to have ST. And then we have two projections. One maps back S to A. And then there is another one, which is a little more mysterious because you can think of this as you have to really take it seriously that um, there is also the fiber at S, I'll draw it here. There is the fiber at S. And so now this, um, the second, this is the first projection. The second projection maps somewhere in here. It gets you T, okay. Um, there are some equations. So here's, here are some equations. If you take the first projection of a pair, then you get S. If you take the second projection, you get T. Yes. Um, 
I will answer the question in the chat. So, and then there is another one, which morally speaking says everything is a pair. If I take U, if U is an arbitrary element of this dependent sum. So if I just say, oh, well, how about if I just have some random U here, I could worry maybe that there is a mysterious U that isn't an ordered pair somehow in my total space. By the way, this sometimes happened in some, in some models of some type theories. It can happen that you get elements which are not there, which, which you didn't expect. For instance, let me give you an example. If you define in Haskell um, or some other functional language, you define the data type of natural numbers. You might naively think that you will only get the natural numbers, but depending on how the language is set up, you might also get the infinite number or you might get the non-terminating number and stuff like that. So sometimes you can actually have mysterious elements that were not supposed to be there. Well, this equation is saying, no, 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 everything is a pair, okay? No, no, no funny elements. If you take any U, you take it apart, you calculate its projections, you put it back together, you will get U, you're not gonna get something else. There was, a, there was a question about, can you have a type in the context or only variable and their assigned type? The context must be, the context always contains pairs, variable column type. The point of the context is to tell you what are the types of variables, okay? So you can't, if you want to hypothesize that A is a type, you have to do that differently sort of at a meta level by saying I have a meta variable A, which is a type. So it's one level up. The context can only contain pairs. This variable has this type. This variable has this type. This variable has this type. Okay, did I answer your question? Who was this? DG. Hope I did. Um, there is a special case of a dependent sum. Namely, you can think about what happens if this B is always the same. If it doesn't actually depend on A, what do we get? Well, then just we get a binary product and I'm going to convince you. So suppose, suppose this is my B. If I try hard enough, uh, I can do better. Suppose this is my B. Okay, now I'm sorry that I did it. And then this is my A. And now every fiber is this. So it's always this one. So here is this one. Oops, there we go. Here it's this one. Here's this one. It's always the same one. Like that. Well, what are we going to get? Then we're going to get the product, right? Like this. It's just going to be A cross B. This is B. This is A. So the binary product is a special case. Okay, let's go on. Okay, then we have the dependent product. If I have to say it in words, the dependent product is the space of sections. Up here, later earlier, we saw the image of a single section, but you can imagine that there should be a space of all sections. And indeed there is one and it's called the dependent product. So um, let's see, what are its elements? Well, you form an element by providing a function, that is to say a rule, which maps elements of A to elements of B of X. So this E here has to be an element of, maybe I add that here as a, cons as, as a, so this A, it has to be of type B of X. You can again look up the rules and you will see that they require E that it has to be in type of B of X. So that's what a section is. You give a rule like that. A more mathematical notation might be X maps to E, but I'm going to use the Lambda calculus and I'm not going to discuss the details of, of, the, of, the, uh, term, uh, of the notation regarding the Lambda calculus. There is one other operation apart from forming a section, which is to apply a section to figure out what result it returns. So if you have a map, if you have a function S um, from A to B, so I'm just going to say S is a map from A to B, or S is a dependent map from A to B if I want to emphasize the fact that it's dependent. So if you have S from A to B and you have T in A, then you can apply S to T, no parentheses, 
I'm randomly writing parentheses and not writing parentheses when I apply things. Uh, I don't I don't know how what what system my subconscious has chosen, but sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. So what do you get? Well, then you get an, a point in B of T, and you can draw a little picture to see that that's not too surprising. Uh, what are the equations governing functions? Well, how do I apply a function? If I have a rule that says x is mapped to e and I apply it to t, what will I get? I will get e where x is replaced with t. So this means replace x with t in the usual capture avoiding way if there are bound variables, la 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 la. If you're not familiar with how this works, you should you want to look it up probably after the lectures. But I, I, if you just, at this point, if you don't know what it is, let me just tell you that you have been using it all your life, this rule, and it's not surprising. Um, there is another one which says that everything is a function. Just like earlier, we had everything is an ordered pair. Then we have a rule that says everything is a function. How do you say that? Well, the, the recipe is general. You take, a general, you take a general object of your type. So here's a general element. Here's a, here's a function from A to B. How do I take it apart? I apply it. And then I put it back together, which is this. Just like earlier, I took u apart by projecting and then I put it back together by forming a pair. Now I'm going to apply, then put back together, and this should be equal to s. So this is saying the dependent type doesn't have any weird elements. Uh, by the way, this may be uh, interesting to, uh, uh, if, if you've seen these bef things before, this is interderivable with the following rule which is you could call the extensionality rule, by the way, rule, super important that this is not function extensionality, which we'll see later, which says that if u, if u of x equals v of x for an arbitrary free variable x, then when you form the lambdas, you will get the same thing. Um, okay, so um, what is a spe what special case do we get when the type doesn't depend on A. Well, again, now I'm going to draw a slightly less complicated picture so that it doesn't take such a long time. So if this is my B and this is my A, okay? So then when I form, what are the sections? What are the sections over this? Well, a section, is going to be any sort of any sort of map, right? A section looks like this. And so it's just always mapping into S. At each fiber, this is B. So it's always B, so it's always mapping into S. So that's just the usual function space from of, of all the maps from A to B. So that's a special case of a dependent product, namely the dependent product without dependence. Any questions at this point? Why are they called sum and product? Very good question, okay? So this, um, <coughs> this, one is called, this one is called a sum because you're summing things together. So let me draw a little picture. So suppose, so if you think about what happens, um, when you have finite, finitely many things. So suppose I have, why sum, okay? So if you think about something like this, if you have three elements, say A, B, C, and then up here, I have just three types, B of A, B of B, B of C, and then they have a bunch of things in them like that, okay? When I form the sum, think of it, how many elements will I get? Well, I'm just going to get the sum of the sizes of the Bs because there is no, there is no overlap between these Bs. So this is also called sometimes a disjoint sum. It's because you really are literally doing the type theoretic version of summing things together by putting them together. Just like when you have, a, you know, you have some baskets of fruit 
and you take them all together, you've summed them. Now you have the sum of them. That's what the name come, where the name comes from. Does that answer the question, Cameron? Is that a good enough question answer? Yeah, yeah thank you. It's just yeah. uh, interesting because in the spatial uh, intuition, uh, the sum gives you a product, and the product gives you an exponent, right? So this is just. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's I, maybe I, a little I bit. I understand now um, uh, what the intuition is. Yeah, of, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, the fact that you get a product that's in here is. You, you, but you know what this is? This, this is when you're in the kindergarten and they tell you to multiply three and four, what do you do? You sum up three fours. That's how you learn what a product is using sums. And this is precisely what that is. That's just. And this is also why the multiplication gives you exponentiation, right? Because it's right. It's, then know. here it's the same, right? So okay. here the product is you're taking one of each, right? When you're taking a product, when I take a section off here, I will pick one here, pick one here, pick one here. And then in another way, in another way, in another way. How, in how many ways can I select for, can I, can I select one from each set? Well, now you have to multiply these numbers to see how many there are. And then when it doesn't depend, you get exponentiation. And that's how you learn exponentiation, of course, when they tell you that four, you know, four to the third power, right, is just four times four times four. It's just that. Um, somebody's asking, uh, is there a way, nice way to speak about duality in this formalism? There are lots of ways to speak about various kinds of duality in this formalism. Um, and uh, uh, so the answer is yes, but that's not a very specific answer, but I think we'll see some examples this week. Um, okay, so uh, is this MLTT or, or HOT? This is so far just Martin Love type theory. I haven't done anything specific to HOT. Homotopy type theory is an extension of Martin Love type theory by some further additional principles which we will get to. Okay, we have seven minutes to cover natural numbers and universes and finite types. So let's keep going. Um, an important type uh, to, to learn about is the natural numbers. And here I want to show it just because it, there's, you should feel that there is nothing surprising about it. So of course, we're going to have zero, which is an element of the natural numbers. And we have an operation called successor, which is S here. And if you have, if you already have a natural number n, you can form s of n, and that's going to be a natural number. So those are the ways you make natural numbers. And then you always have to ask, well, but what can I do with natural numbers? And the answer is, you have the induction principle. So usually, if you look at piano arithmetic, they also say you have a plus and you have a times and you have the induction principle. Well, here we will just need the induction principle because the way that type theory works is that you can then special, specialize this induction principle um, to a recursion and then you can uh, define functions by primitive recursion. And so that, there's, that just gives you a lot of functions. And because you have higher types and function spaces, you can in fact get more than just the primitive recursive functions. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, given a type P over N, so what does it mean? Whenever you see P over N, that just means I have a type P which depends on N. What, how do we state the induction principle? We can state the induction principle by stating that there is an element of a certain type. This is maybe not the most optimal way of stating induction, but that's how we can do also do it. Um, pedagogically, why did I show the dependent sum first? Can it be encoded via pi types? Pedagogically, there is no good reason. And if you look at Egbert's book, I think he does products first uh, and um, uh, can it be encoded via pi types? I don't think so, at least not easily. Those really are two different fundamental constructions. They even have each their own universal property, which relates them to something, but I'm not going to get into that now. Let's get to the induction. So if you have an element, so here how we're going to state induction, which you normally think of as a logical principle, we're going to state it as a, as a point in a space. Induction in N is a point in a certain function space. And by the way, when you see, when you see several arrows, they associate to the right. So what does it say? It's a function space. It takes an element of P of zero. So it wants an, so it's a function which takes an element in P of zero, and then it takes 
an element of this, what is this? Well, this is the induction step. It says, if I have a, so it's a function which for any k gives me, from, transforms p of k to p the successor of k. So this is the base of the induction. This is the induction hypothesis. And the conclusion is that I'm going to get a section. See, this is, says a section of p, which is not, nothing other than just saying whatever number you give, give me, I'll give you a, an element if p of n. So this is induction type, uh, stated type theoretically. What would be the, now here's something that you don't do when you do induction, which is that you think about equations involving induction because it's unnatural to think about that because induction is a logical principle. But here we changed it so that it's really an element of a type so we can calculate because it's a function. We should ask what happens when we apply it? Well, let's three. To how many things should we apply induction? We should apply it to two, two things, three things. To the base case, so we give an element which is, serves as the base case. We give a map which serves as the induction step, and then we pick a number, and then we ask what's the result. So this is the base case. This is the induction step. This is the number. If you apply it at zero, you expect to get the base case. And if you apply the success at the successor, then you then you expect that what will happen is that the induction step, which is t will compute the value from the previous one and you get a recursive call. And this is the root of, this is, this is where recursion is going to come from. And this is why we will be able to use induction to define things like addition. So somebody asked whether elements means constructors. Okay, so that's, uh, that is a deep question where if I give you a type like this, the natural numbers, and then I ask you, what are its elements? Now it's natural to think that you would say, ah, well, but the elements of N, we define the elements of N to mean that they are just zero and things of the form successor, successor, successor of zero, okay? Now that is both a good and a bad way of thinking about it. Because for instance, I can define an element like this. I can say Lambda X, S of S of X apply to S of the zero. So first of all, this is going to be a natural number. It's a function applied. It's not successor, successor, successor of something. Of course, it's equal by the rules that we have so far. It's going to be equal to one of them. One, two, three, okay. But, Strictly speaking, this is a syntactic form, which is not exactly S of S of S of zero. And also importantly, I might be in a funny context, like for instance, in a context that contains the empty type, which we will see shortly. Oh, oh, I'm doing this all wrong, right? I'm supposed to have a 20 minute lecture followed by exercises. Ah, excellent. I'm off by 20 minutes. So we will see later on, that I can construct a natural number like this. So now this one is not a successor. So in, in a non-empty context, all, all weird things can happen. The term T is the induction step, yes. Okay, so since I am totally uh, off with my timing, let's see, um, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm now have to improvise things a little bit. Okay, so then we have finite types. We have the empty type, the rule for the empty type says that if you have an element T of the empty type, then you can get a, an element of any other type. The way you read this rule is it says that zero is as empty as all the other types. Then we have the unit type, which has a single element, which I write as an empty tuple. And then the equation is that all elements of the unit type are equal. And then we have Booleans, which have false and true. And, uh, they allow us, so the, how do we use them? We use them by doing things by cases. So if I, so this is like an if then else statement. It says, consider the case, this is if B then S else T. So I could write this as if B then else, then S else T. And there would be nothing wrong with that. If B then S else T, okay. Um, the question is why is case not presented similarly to int? But uh, yes, it could be. 
So exercise, write case similarly to int and in reverse, write int similarly to case. I, was, I wanted to show different ways of introducing things. I do not want to be very um, consistent regarding formalism. Um, I want to, you to focus on uh, the math, the contents, but please do ask questions about formalism that confuse you. But notice that often my answer will be, oh, I was just, you know, I wasn't very careful about how I did it. I know how to be very careful in, with formalism, but I don't think today is the day that we should be doing that. So the case is then just, well, if you have, if true, then S else T is S, and if false, then S and T is T. So that's another kind of type that you can have. Okay, then we have universes. And the idea here is the following. Well, if types are about constructions, we have just given a bunch of constructions of types. We told, you know, here we have n is a type and up here we have, this is a way of constructing a type. Pi is a way of constructing a type. So types themselves are constructions. So it should stand to reason that there should be a type of types and such a type is called a universe. And now you can say, well, okay, but um, so let's say that we will say that a universe is a kind of a type of types, but it's important to never try to put all types into a universe. In particular, U should not be an element of U because that leads to Russell style paradoxes. Um, and we want, we should always discuss the question of, well, this universe, what sort of operations is it closed under? So we will at the very least want it to be closed under sigma spies and the identity types that will come in a minute. We could have many universes. So usually if you just have a single universe, then you say that it's, you call its elements small types, but you can have a hierarchy of universes um, where you have many of them and it, they may or may not be cumulative. Cumulative means that if you have a, something in a universe, then you all, that the same thing is also in the next universe. That is to say, that they are that they form this increase that they form this increasing chain of universes. Agda doesn't have cumulative universes. Koch has uni has uh, cumulative universes. So this is kind of a little bit open here. Um, and uh, the main observation so far is that if you think about it, what is a dependent type? You will say, well, but a dependent type is more or less just a function from a type to the universe because for every element X, it gives us something in U, which is a type. So I will often now, instead of saying that A is a dependent type B over A and so on, I'll just write a function like this. I'll say, suppose we have a dependent type B, A arrow U. Um, there are technicalities here because in principle, you could have a B, a dependent type B, where it doesn't actually map into any single universe because it keeps giving you bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger things. Um, that, is a, that is a technical question I don't want to get into. But for instance, if you like to think about these questions, you should now be asking me, hey, how about you? Is it, an, is it something that goes from natural numbers to what? What does it go to? You know, maybe here there is this, but if there is this, then you're going to cook up one more, right? And then you will say, well, one more, one more, one more, you'll never get to the end of it. So there is this, this is the sort of thing that's best discussed under formalism. So now I have already, I'm over time, um, but we have some exercises here, but luckily these exercises are not very, um, are not very crucial. So let's see what